Uh, Mr. Joe McGinnis is the author of a best-selling book called The Selling of the President, 1968, which is touted by the publishers as, quotes, the inside story of how Nixon was really elected. It is the fruit of a great deception. That is to say, one cannot suppose that competent people would have confided to Mr. McGinnis or permitted him to observe their efforts if they had known that he intended to write such a book as he has written. It is rather as though Marlene Dietrich were to invite the Candid Camera Club of America to photograph her step by step at the beauty parlor. But most Americans do not care how a story was got, just so long as it was got. And the purpose of this discussion is to explore the role of public relations in politics, particularly in presidential politics. Mr. McGinnis is from Rye, New York, and a graduate of Holy Cross College. He began doing sports for the paper in Worcester, then went to Philadelphia, where after a while he began writing a column for the Philadelphia Inquirer. He dropped his column in June of 1968, intending to a book, do a book on the selling of the president. He asked the Humphrey people if he might tag along, but they said, hell no, you can't tag along. The Nixon people were less cautious, and he moved during four months with the top television advisors to Mr. Nixon, and then brought out his book. Before we get into the general subject, I should like to touch on the question which has been raised here and there of the bias of Mr. McGuinness. It has to do, of course, with whether his observations are to be trusted or whether they were strained through a hostility filter which makes them unreliable. I'd like to begin by asking Mr. McGuinness whether he believes that the same kind of a book might as well have been written about uh, Hubert Humphrey. Well, I think the same kind of a book uh, could have been written about Humphrey if his people had been a little more open. I don't think, though, that the, uh, the Humphrey television campaign was either as extensive or as successful as the Nixon campaign. So I don't think that a Humphrey book would have been as relevant, uh, not because of any greater uh, degree of morality or higher standard of ethics on the part of Humphrey's people, but simply because there was, I think, less expertise and certainly a lot less money. And the one thing that a television campaign takes is money, which the Nixon camp had from the beginning. But wh why was it not as successful when um, Humphrey rose compared to where he stood at Chicago, whereas Nixon didn't rise compared to where he stood in Miami? Well, I think you have to begin before Miami if you want to really evaluate the uh, successes or failures of the Nixon television campaign. These ideas were first formulated back in November of 1967. And I think the bulk of the image building, image changing work with Richard Nixon was done between November of 67, or certainly before the New Hampshire primary, between then and the Miami convention. Uh, during then, they, you know, they completely eliminated the, uh, the tricky dick, uh, the loser image, all these bad things that had been hangovers of 1962. And by the time Mr. Nixon went to Miami, I think it was almost to be coronated, not nominated. And well, but, but what you observed was post-Miami, was it not? Well, it started in June, so it was about two months before Miami. Yeah. And from then, it was post-Miami. And I think uh, even post-Miami, they were able to project this image which had been projected through the primary states uh, to the country as a whole. And why Humphrey rose after Chicago probably has more to do with why Humphrey was so low at Chicago. I think it was unrealistic to have one candidate uh, 24 points ahead of another candidate in a poll right after the conventions. And I think there was a certain natural evening up process that took place. And there were other factors which uh, relate more directly to the television campaign, namely that this Nixon effort was so professional, so slick, uh, so well done, that uh, toward the end, I think people began to react against it a little bit. Which that, would mean it was not very well done. <laughs> well, it was, uh, it was well I mean, done The, the standards are purely instrumental. It's well done uh, if it increases somebody's popularity and is badly done if it doesn't. Right. It was well done until, say, October 15th. But they, what they failed to take into account, I think, were, were changing public tastes. You know, the one problem with advertising in a political campaign is you don't have the time to do market research to tell you uh, when a particular campaign is wearing thin and when a new approach should be begun. And one problem with what you say is it's self-justifying. You can never be wrong if you're, well, saying, if you're saying what you see the taste happen to change. You can never, you know, in advertising, you can never be right and you can never be wrong. You can't prove anything statistically. 
whether it's product advertising or political well, advertising. Why is it that you permit your publishers to say the inside story of how Nixon really won the election? Well, you know how publishers are. Uh, you want to review, you want to write, write a book about your publishers? I, I'm doing at least a magazine article about them. Uh -huh. but, uh, <laughs> well, I want to read that. The, uh, uh, the, uh, 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 Mr. Nixon, you say this began sort of like November 67. These were the, well, Mr. Nixon decided to run, I think, before then, but mm -hmm. by November of 67, this, this younger, new group of, of image advisors who had gathered around him were beginning to formulate specific plans mm -hmm. uh, and, and theoretical concepts which would form the basis of that, uh, the television campaign of 68. So wow. I think that's as good a starting date to pick as any. Well, let me see. Mr. Nixon was on this program in December of 1967. Uh, what do you suppose he was instructed to do on this program in order to ingratiate himself with uh, whoever he wanted to ingratiate himself with? Well, I don't think on a program like this he would have to do much because he would realize he was facing a friendly interviewer and uh, <laughs> it would not be the difficulty that he might face if he were you know, to appear, for example, on a, on a Gore Vidal program or a Norman, <laughs> you know, be interviewed well, by Norman Mailer. Uh, well, that, I think that's a little bit facile because uh, after all, Mr. Nixon has belonged to a wing of the party different from uh, from my own, and it seems to me, under the circumstances, that he would might have been rather anxious to uh, appear what uh, extremely conservative or what. Well, I'm not sure, but uh, in December '67, at least, he was still appearing on programs which were not commercial programs, where he hadn't bought the time, where he hadn't hired you to ask the proper questions. The whole thrust of the book is that. The Nixon camp, and Nixon didn't just use television, but he used very deliberately controlled television, which means that every cameraman, every producer, every director was hired by his staff, and the whole purpose of the program was to flatter him, to bring out personality qualities which his staff believed the voters would respond to. Okay, now uh, let's go to April 1968. I was down in Washington for a meeting of the American Association of newspaper uh, editors, and Nixon appeared uh, before about uh, six or seven hundred tough editors, and there was a panel of six people who were not selected by Nixon, but were selected by the host, including some uh, anti-Nixon people. Now, how do you account for that? Was it televised? No. Well, I think he appeared, you know, uh all throughout the campaign. In yeah, but it's not very easy to, to conduct a private seance in front of 800 editors. Well, no, it's not. But th again, the whole thrust of, of his image advisor's thinking was that whatever newspaper reports might rise out of an appearance before a group like that could very easily be counteracted by direct and controlled television appearances. They felt that no matter what the press said about Mr. Nixon, he could overcome it by going directly to the people through television. Why did he go and meet the press in July or 1st of August? No, he didn't go and meet the press until the until two weeks before Election Day, and he went and faced the nation the week after. Uh, I'm talking about the meet the press that he did in Miami. Oh, before the convention? Yeah. Well, during the campaign after the convention, he appeared on, you know, he rejected that whole concept, and Mr. Shakespeare, who was, I think, formulating most of uh, the image strategy, thought that it would be, uh, it was unnecessary for him to appear and it was taking an unnecessary risk. And only in the last two weeks of the campaign when the public outcry and Mr. Humphrey's outcry about Nixon not appearing on these shows reached such a crescendo that they finally and reluctantly decided that he could be hurt less even by a bad appearance on a show like this than he could, than he was being hurt by a, a continued refusal to appear. But it, it seems to me that a, a couple of things don't get um coped with quite accurately from your book, but uh, be be before, before we turn to those, uh, um, ha have you actually successfully, do you think, examined your own biases sufficiently to, uh, uh, to be able to say, uh, frankly, that your handling of Nixon was purely professional and that it wasn't actually animated by a high degree of hostility? Well, I don't think, it, well, let's, let's start from the beginning. I don't think, in fact, I am convinced that there is no such thing, at least in the political area, as a totally objective reporter. Mm -hmm. I think any reporter goes into any situation with, with personal feelings and attitudes toward the people involved and toward the situation. And that the only area in which dishonesty creeps in is if the reporter is to pretend to be completely objective. For example, you know, if the New York Times covers the, the Columbia riots, 
and pretends to be writing a totally objective news story about that. I think that's dishonest because obviously the editorial board and the reporters assigned mm -hmm. have personal feelings, which they, they attempt to disguise. You know, against riots. Yeah, I would think so. Mm -hmm. And even in 1960 and 64, I think Theodore White, you know, and those, I think those are, all three of them are, I think are very good books. Uh, in 60 and 64, he, had, he, he wrote them under the guise of an objective reporter. And it wasn't until this past year with the 68 book that he dropped this mask and expressed directly what his point of view was. He was very clear this year that uh, he was in favor of, uh, you know, he thought Lyndon Johnson was treated unfairly. He supported Daly rather than the other elements in Chicago. And I think whether you agree or disagree with that point of view, at least it is a, it, it's a growth and it's a more honest point of view. I had feelings about Richard Nixon. I didn't intend to vote for him. I didn't vote for him. And I think in the book, I expressed those feelings. I don't think that it's a polemic, but I think that it's only fair to the reader to let him know from what source are his interpretations and are, are these observations coming. Well, Mr. McGinnis, you, you confess then to uh, having a certain hostility towards uh, uh, Mr. Nixon, and I guess uh, the inference would be that this was the conventional hostility against Mr. Nixon, i.e. one that was sort of oriented <coughs> towards uh, the Democrats. But in fact, didn't you tell somebody that you would have voted for Dick Gregory? Well, I would have, but I think that expresses more hostility toward Hubert Humphrey than, uh, than toward Nixon. I mean, I, you know, I think from my own point of view last year that uh, we were just given two sides of the same coin, that uh, the, the whole, the, not the Republican machinery, which worked as a traditional machinery works, but the Democratic machinery was really unfair to the people who, for seven consecutive primaries, tried to repudiate you know, the Johnson policy. Mm -hmm. And when we get Johnson's candidate as the Democratic candidate, I think that there has to be some option open to a voter to say no, to say that this system uh, did not provide me with a sufficient choice. Mm -hmm. And with Dick Gregory on the ballot in Pennsylvania, which was my home state, I thought that was the most effective way of voting no. To not vote at all would be to give George Wallace uh, a higher percentage of the total, which mm -hmm. I didn't want to do. Well, but, but mightn't some people who have, uh, who have kept track of you conclude, really, that your hostility uh, to Nixon is merely a very small aspect of your hostility to the United States? Oh, I don't think that. I don't think so. I think a well, lot of the uh, people you, you wrote quotes, we do not live in a country anymore, but in a cesspool. This country does not work anymore. This is not a country. The richest, most powerful place in the world and all that money and power have produced have been a bunch of people so filled with fear and hate and ugliness that when a man tries to tell them they must do more for other men instead of listening, they shoot him in the head. This is not a country anymore. This is a vision of hell. You know when I wrote that? Oh, sure. Yeah, I wrote that on the airplane to Los Angeles about six hours after Robert Kennedy had been shot. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, at the time, it was something that I, that I felt, this coming on top of the King assassination, you know, six or seven weeks apart, I think it was, uh, it was a fair observation at the time. Yeah, but lots of people went through those two assassinations without saying that America was a vision of hell. True, but I think other were people... Were they insensitive? I wouldn't say they were insensitive. Well, I would what were say you? that uh, they weren't writing newspaper columns uh, you know, at I was. 7 o'clock in the morning on an airplane. I'd write them at 3 o'clock in the morning. You were... <laughs> <laughs> they read that way? You work harder than I do, maybe. <laughs> but, uh, no, but I don't think that, uh, that to take that one particular column out of perhaps 400 columns that I wrote for the Philadelphia Inquirer is to suggest uh, fairly that I had a sustained hostility and hatred for America, which is it's not the case. Well, that isn't that a little bit like saying that. Uh, uh, isn't that a little bit like saying that uh, uh, most of the time Jack the Ripper wasn't killing people? Uh, I think that a man with your respect for logic and uh, you know the validity of intellectual persuasion would reject that as kind of a, a hyperbole and kind of a false uh, a false analogy. Well, look, there, there are an awful lot of people who are very much in favor of Martin Luther King and of Bobby Kennedy who didn't react to the assassination by saying this is a vision of hell. I grant a few people did, but of those people who did, is it or is it not fair to say that there's something bugging them uh, which might show itself in a sort of a genteel suppuration in such a book as you wrote? Well. Uh, your, your sort of uh, 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 hostility uh, 
to uh, well, not only to Nixon, but to what Nixon stands for, to the middle class, to middle class values, to American institutions, and so on and so forth. Mightn't that be sort of a gentler uh, uh, expression of what you said here in what might actually have been a moment of, uh, of uh, confronting your readers with what deep inside you harbored about this country? Or how do you cope with that? Well, I, I think, first of all, I mean, I can cope with it, I think, but you know, it's unfortunate, I think, that you're going to have to try to, uh, to first uh, almost disbar me as a, as, a, as a valid observer of this whole thing, because really the point of the book is not Richard Nixon. It's the influence of uh, electronic media on the political process, and I don't think that's a terribly partisan situation. I think, mm -hmm. you know, this is what the thrust of the book is, and the fact that the book has Richard Nixon on the cover is uh, a result more of, of, of the Humphreys. Chance. St <laughs> chance. Absolute chance. Yeah, but the thing but is that uh, your book has become very popular. Incidentally, uh, let me say right now, I, I think it's an extraordinarily good book. I think it's an extremely interesting book. I wouldn't have not read it for the world. I hope everybody does read it. But uh, I do think that what gives the book that final zing is the organization of its bias. And the organization of its bias is precisely congruent with the bias of most of the people who push books in this country. If it had been, been a book that showed that Gene McCarthy was really a phony, do you think you've gotten all those ecstatic reviews from all over the world? Not the New York Times, probably. Yeah, not anybody. Not the Newsweek. Except me. Perhaps a better, yes, right. Yeah, yeah. I, I might have done better with Mr. Kilpatrick than I did. but. Uh, yeah, well, uh, actually, Mr. Kilpatrick said uh, precisely the same thing. Uh, he said that uh, uh, that uh, it, your, quote, hatred of Nixon shown uh, through much of what you, Well, here's what he said. It, it is reasonable certainty that Hubert Humphrey went through precisely the same takes and retakes and received the same sort of coaching that Nixon received, but McGinnis barely acknowledged the fact, which is true, isn't it? It's true, because mm -hmm. I wasn't there firsthand. Yeah, for instance, for instance, at one point you said that uh, somebody made it a point to take the shirt sleeve of Mr. Humphrey out and let it drip around in order to make him look sort of homey, but you kind of like that. I mean, you thought, well, I made Well, no, I didn't. Yeah. No, I think you misinterpreted that. Did I? Uh, that half-hour Humphrey film toward yeah. the end of the campaign, which they billed as the mind changer, yeah. which showed Humphrey crawling down a bowling alley uh, in his shirt sleeves trying to fix a pin spider, and when he finally succeeds, he walks back and slaps Muskie on the back and said, well, Ed, that's one problem we solved. Mm -hmm. And then later, uh, to have him embracing and talking to his retarded granddaughter, mm -hmm. uh, I think for the sake of a political commercial, is, is utterly uh, you know, tasteless and, and maudlin and deplorable. Mm -hmm. But even Nixon's own people, uh, Roger Ailes for one, said, I watched that in the hotel room for the first time with Roger, and I said, well, that's just a disgrace. You know, those people just don't know what they're doing. And he said, you're wrong. He said, to you and I, it's a disgrace, but to all those housewives out there in Minnesota and Wisconsin, they're going to say, what a dear, kind man. And they're going to say, what a warm human being. And it, it will turn out, Roger said, to be one of the most effective single pieces of political advertising the whole campaign. And I think he was right. And I think that that's where the whole problem is, that this kind of, uh, of tasteless maudlin uh, presentation can be so effective, I think that's where the real situation is. Well, I, th <clears throat> I think that you're right. Uh, if I understand you to be saying that um, um, if, if you are going to reach for the lowest common denominator of, of votes, then you want to do certain things which, which might not come naturally, but which do actually increase your following. But I'm trying to get a slightly different point, which is that what I call the organizing bias uh, of your book <coughs> is really quite consistent. You, uh, there's one passage, for instance, that has been quoted by practically all of your reviews. They love it. They thought of savor it again and again and again. The situation <laughs> is that uh, Czechoslovakia is invaded by the Soviet Union. You remember that? I do. Yeah. And um, uh, Shakespeare is there with Len Leonard Gormand, who's an advisor to the president of Shakespeare's then. And he says, they're out to get us, Len. They always have been and they always will be. They're ruthless bastards. And they're trying to conquer the world. We have to stand up to them at every turn. Now, uh, for instance, uh, Mr. Kempton quoted that section as the final documentation of the imbecility of Shakespeare. And then he said, and this is the man who was named director of USIA. Um, uh, the idea being presumably that who should have been named director of USIA was Ben Spock uh, or somebody. Now. Uh, uh, you, you present this, and it's very obvious to even a casual reader that this is the epitome of childishness, uh, international childishness, as far as you're concerned. Now, I, I, I take it it is. 
Well, I, I mean, think... You're, you're sort of horrified, isn't it? I don't you think, think you that anybody should think that, right? Well, no, I don't think so. You don't, I mean, I'm sure you don't find it horrifying. In no, fact, no, no. The, you know... I couldn't, when, I wish I'd said it. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to say it. I mean, really. It's, uh, I think that it's just a point of interest that the reaction of Mr. Nixon's chief television advisor uh, the morning after the Czechoslovakian invasion was to burst into a, into a taping studio and say, this is just perfect. It puts the soft liners in a hell of a box. And I think that no, no matter... You see, this is an example of your unfairness, and some people have, 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 have referred to that. If you're implying that Shakespeare was glad that the chance for freedom no. of Czechoslovakia was overwhelmed because it might make an extra vote for Nixon, I think that you are really going too far. That would be a false implication. Yeah. But what I am suggesting, and the reason why that passage is included in the book, is to suggest that <coughs> during the process of a political campaign, the men who are hard at work manipulating the minds of, of the voters and viewers, uh, the first instinct is to react to a thing with total pragmatism. Mm -hmm. And you know, whatever uh, deep sorrow Mr. Shakespeare might have felt at the plight of the Czechoslovakian people was sublimated to his, his, his first response, which was, this helps us, because all those people who said Nixon is too tough on Russia no longer but have as true. much to say. That's, of course, true. It's so perfectly true. So why, why should I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you an example. Yeah. So suppose, uh, 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 suppose uh, uh, in 1960, in the summer, the United States had fallen into a deep depression. Exactly what would have happened was that JFK would have said, I told you so, you know, eight years of Republican rule, and we have a depression. Now, this is different from the notion that, uh, say, Bobby Kennedy sat around saying, God, I hope we'd have a depression in the next couple of months, because that will really ensure our, our victory. Uh, you, you, you agree? I agree. Uh, on sure. the other hand, if it had happened, they would certainly have capitalized on it on the grounds that he was empirical confirmation of what they judged to be false economic policies over the years, correct? I don't think there's any suggestion in the book that Republicans are the only pragmatists. And I don't think that it's anything that, that you should have to be defensive about, really. Well, I'm not at all defensive about it. What I'm, what I'm trying to uh, root out is the extent to which one looks at your book as a scientific contribution uh, to an understanding of public relations and the extent to which one really looks on your book as that, ostensibly, but actually, another anti-Nixon polemic. Well, and it interests me that the same people who collaborated so ardently with uh, an attempt to, for instance, give, give JFK exactly the view that they wanted JFK to have, uh, point to your book as, as a liberating experience. That's why I think that they really like the book because it's anti-Nixon rather than because it's informative about what goes on in American politics. I wouldn't disagree with you there. You but I would say that this is their, uh, that this is their response. You know, I, wrote, I wrote the book, and I think if you want to uh, to try to determine to what extent it's an anti-Nixon polemic and to what extent it's, it's, it's a report of the way electronic, controlled electronic media were used in, in, in the political process last year. To make some kind of a breakdown between uh, what portion of the book consists of my personal comments that are derogatory to Mr. Nixon mm -hmm. and what, port, what portion is a straight report and a uh, straight factual uh, transmission of, of, of correspondence and of conversation and, you know, most of the book, uh, a majority of it, is almost direct quotation. And uh, this was something that the reporter's function is simply to transmit. Yeah, but you, you know, as a reporter, uh, that uh, if you become intimate friends with a few people, they get to speaking to each other in a kind of shorthand, which, if it is transcribed and presented to an alien audience, can have completely the different uh, intention from what you suppose. For instance, if we're very good friends, I said, uh, oh, come on, McGinnis, you old communist. And somebody transcribed this and said Buckley called him a communist. Yeah. Uh, it would have one meaning, right? Whereas it would have a completely different meaning in the kind of, say, offhand conversations that were sometimes had between Ailes and Trevor and so on, right? But everything in there is not quite so offhand. In fact, in the appendix, you know, wherein are contained these memoranda that were very carefully drafted by people like Pat Buchanan and Ray Price, you know, where Price says that... They were? I, called, I spoke with Price this morning. And he said that that wasn't very carefully drafted at all. Well, then he's in, a very in, the good in the first place, you attributed two of them to Gavin that were actually written by Price. In the third place, uh, 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 one, a couple of those memorandum were written, said he, in a form that he occasionally adopts, as sort of a, a stream of consciousness notations to himself. Now, maybe you do that every now and then. I certainly do, which I wouldn't want anybody to read. But the one in particular, 
which is attributed to Price yeah. and which was written by Price November 27th, 67, which said that we must be very clear on this point. It's not what's there that counts. It's what's projected, that the response is to the image, not to the man, and that the image is often more a result of the medium and its use than it is of any qualities on, on the candidate himself. Yeah. That, to me, is the... Sorry, okay. I'll be right with you. Okay. You were saying that to you as what, Mr. McGinnis? I was saying that that, to me, is probably the, the, the single most significant paragraph contained in the whole book, because I think that is what the book is <coughs> about, that it's not what's there that counts, it's what's projected. Mm -hmm. How long did you spend with Nixon personally? With him mm -hmm. as an individual? Yeah. Uh, in direct conversation? Very little time. In uh, fact, no time. I was... Uh, yeah. That was well, not... Well, now, uh, uh, let me tell you this. A yeah. uh, 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 Price spent, oh, maybe 10,000 hours, or however many hours there are in 1967, uh, with Nixon. Uh, he was anti-Nixon, as you may or may not know. And uh, when he wrote that memorandum, I understand him to be saying, look, a lot of people think that Nixon is something which, in fact, I know he isn't because I know him. And therefore, since people think that a guy is what their image of him is, it is important to make that image correspond to what he, in fact, is. Now, uh, under price. the circumstances, this becomes, a, this, this becomes a responsibility of sort of a social architect to actually project what a guy really is. But that's a direct contradiction to what Price actually said, which was, it's not what's there that counts, it's what's projected. I know, but he's right. This is not a contradiction. It's what counts with the voters, you see. If the, voters, uh, uh, if the voters think, let's say, that somebody is a truly compassionate person, truly interested in, in the people, they'll, they'll go for him. Right. Now, that's what counts with the voters. In fact, he may be the world's original uh, misanthrope, right? Mm -hmm. Now, on the other hand, if they think he's a misanthrope, but actually he's one of the world's most compassionate people, Herbert Hoover would be an excellent example, then it becomes a problem for people to help the real Herbert Hoover to project, right? Now, well, isn't this what these people were trying to do? If that's all they were trying to do, and if that's what they did, you know, why are they so embarrassed about the book? I mean, if, if it was simply a projection of the real Nixon, well, which... They, they, they're presumably embarrassed about the book because uh, nobody likes to see 150,000 transcripts around the country of conversations that they had privately, using as said a moment ago, uh, a shorthand which is distinctive to the trade, using us at a moment ago, the analogy of Marlene Dietrich, who doesn't want to see people making her up, even though you might have an impression of the real Marlene Dietrich after it's done. Isn't that, I mean, surely you've had private conversations in your life that you wouldn't want me to read or members of this audience to read, right? Of course, but you know, there are no private conversations reprinted in the book which have to do with anyone's personal life. This is all the only private conversations have to do with the process of electing a president. And I think that that process is, is one that, uh, that does belong, in a certain sense, to the people. And that if it's conducted uh, to such an extent behind closed doors, and if the people well, aren't uh, shut out... Yes, May, I think you're having me on. Look, <coughs> let's take something like the minority question. Everybody's terribly sensitive about minorities. I mean, everybody. Uh, you know, you've got to um, have Negroes, you've got to have Jewish people, you've got to have Catholic people, Irish people, the, the whole business here. So, what is more obvious than that uh, if you're trying to get elected uh, and you're trying to show how sort of eclectic your backing is, you want um, a black man in the audience, right? <clears throat> As a matter of fact, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, uh, I had a program here in Firing Line and uh, uh, a, a, a colored congressman came and had a fit because there wasn't a black man there. And when <coughs> I told him that I hadn't gone to any pains to see that there was one there, but that everybody had been invited and there was 20% of the student body was black in that particular college, but he hadn't bothered to come. Now, my point is, uh, here you have a situation in which this would appear to be obvious that you'd want uh, minority group representation among your questioners. All right. So this becomes, as, as you handle this, you handle this as a mechanical problem, not as a problem in which you sort of give a patriotic speech about America, the boiling pot, the melting pot, at the beginning of each studio performance. So then there's a situation in which you describe that there wasn't a black man there, but Shakespeare said, well, that's all right. There's a there's a Mexican there. So everybody laughs about this. You see how callous, how, how cynical. And yet it seems to me a, a perfectly plain observation for people who want to show uh, that there is mi minority representation, that they should have handled it in that way. And yet it doesn't sound, doesn't sound good in a book. 
You see my point? I see your point, but you know, I again don't think that it is the central point of the book, you know, which might be worth discussing for at least a, a, a few minutes, you know, which is the price observation that the American voter, and this is again Price's phrase, is basically lazy and basically uninterested in making an effort to understand what we're talking about. That if he is to be moved, it is his emotions which have to be roused, not his intellect, because his intellect is so stultified and dormant and sound asleep because of onslaughts of Beverly Hillbillies and Mayberry RFD that uh, it's very hard for a politician to break through that way. So let's rouse him emotionally by the projection of an image with which he can identify. And that in the television age, when most of our exposure to political candidates comes through television, the voter makes uh, an identification between the political candidate on television and all the other television celebrities to which he is exposed, to whom he is exposed. So that, as Price said, personality is the most important factor. That the American voter wants his president to be a combination of God, father, hero, pope, king, leading man, all these things you know, which no single human being can be. And the voter creates the illusion in his mind that this is what the president should be. So men are drawn into the political process to fulfill that illusion. Mm -hmm. And they do it far more successfully through uh, sophisticated uses of television technique, because television is such a powerful medium of expression, than they could ever do it before. And that the line, therefore, between politics and show business is becoming uh, almost, well, it's, it's indistinct already, I think, and it's becoming almost non-existent. And this, to me, as the writer of the book, is the central point of the book. Well, it may be the central uh, uh, point of, uh, of the book, but it fails to contend with the argument that uh, 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 television exposes every bit as well as it conceals. Uh, there's, there's a very important distinction to make here. It all depends what kind of television you're talking about. This kind of television, where I come on your show and where you are certainly not employed by Simon & Schuster to make me look good for an hour, you know, where I'm not paying your salary. This kind of television might expose, at least it has the chance to. But the kind of television which made up 90% of Mr. Nixon's campaign, and which Price, again, was so careful to stress, had to be controlled television, where the entire situation was staged by Nixon staff members to highlight personality qualities of Mr. Nixon, which they wanted to project. That is not an exposing medium. Well, I don't see why you don't say it's an exposing medium. Uh, you, you, uh, Mr. Nixon had a series of programs done around the country. Uh, uh, he had people brought in who were not coached, who could ask such questions as they wanted to ask. In fact, uh, one of the most interesting episodes in your own book is about a guy who asked all kinds of questions that he sort of resented hearing. In fact, Mrs. Nixon wouldn't talk to you in the elevator, you said, because she was so upset about it. So there was an exposure there. The now, you say right. that it slipped, yes. right? The single exception in, uh, in, in 10 programs, an average of seven panelists on each program, 70 people. One man snuck in, or was allowed in, who had the professional ability in questioning to actually uh, contend with Mr. Nixon and his responses. And the reaction of the Nixon staff after that program was, my God, this was awful. We must make sure this never happens again. Now, I don't think that they were seeking exposure, because if they were, if they were seeking a real communication, they would have welcomed that kind of a thing. Now, Roger Ailes did. Roger Ailes, who was the producer, said this was terrific. This was the best show he's done, because he stood up to that guy, and he answered him, and he handled himself very well. And in, in, the, in the free swinging exchange, Ailes believed, and I believed, and I said so in the book, that Mr. Nixon came off the better. But the men above Ailes, the men who were so worried about exercising direct control and not exposing Mr. Nixon to any kind of pressure or any kind of uh, prodding penetration from the outside, said this was just awful, and this kind of thing could not be allowed to happen again. Well, uh, do, we, do we then concede that uh, Nixon used a technique in which he actually exposed himself to strangers, uh, he answered their questions as best he could, those strangers were screened but were not necessarily pro-Nixon people. Now, by contrast, what we are used to in time that is bought by the candidates is a situation in which you're not exposed to anybody. Uh, you just say your pretty little pieces, uh, in the case of Mr. Rockefeller, when he ran for governor four years ago, they didn't even allow Rockefeller's voice to be shown. They just had encomiums to Rockefeller, plus a lot of visually pleasing things, all the uh, things that he had accomplished. So therefore, has, didn't Mr. Nixon in his campaign go a step towards more general exposure than what had been the rule up until then? He may have, but not for the reason we'd like to believe. Uh, th their problem was that 
if you're going to <coughs> direct and, and to conduct uh, such a controlled campaign, that there is bound to be some kind of reaction from elements who are opposed to you saying, Mr. Nixon is afraid to face the people. Now, they could answer this argument, and they could also project even more powerfully their conceived image of Mr. Nixon by putting him in front of seven people who had been very carefully selected. And the selection process went on for three days before each of these shows. And uh, we talked about the you know, m minority representation which existed. But the one thing that all these people had in common, with the single exception of Mr. McKinney in Philadelphia, was that none of them was trained to ask a question in a professional, direct manner, and that there was no opportunity for follow-up. Because there was a studio audience, you know, much bigger than there is here. There were 350 people brought into the studio. They were all Republicans. They were all Nixon partisans. And their role, according to Roger Ailes, was simply to serve as an applause machine. And they were, they were briefed on this. They were warmed up ahead of time by a television producer who said, after each of Mr. Nixon's answers, applaud. And in a couple of cases, actually, applause signs flashed in the studio. So the housewife who was brought in to represent uh, the, the, uh, the suburban housewife uh, contingent of the voting populace would say, well, Mr. Nixon, just what can we do about Vietnam? A very loosely, generally worded question, yeah. which Mr. Nixon would respond to in precisely the same manner that he had been responding to that question since before New Hampshire. Well, we must assume that the, the, the Vietnam situation begged for the identical solution between New Hampshire and late September. No, but it perhaps uh, would have benefited from a little more direct discussion. So that when Mr. Nixon gave his answer, which uh, they had someone in the, in the control booth of the stopwatch actually timing his answers to try to get them down shorter and shorter in time because this was better show business. When he gave the answer, the applause would start. And by the time the applause was finished, he would then turn to the Jewish attorney who sat next to the suburban housewife. Mm -hmm. And the Jewish attorney would ask a question about the Middle East. Mm -hmm. So that there was no opportunity you know, for follow-up or for real discussion. But the premise, the advertised premise of the shows was Mr. Nixon discusses the problems of America directly on live television with the American people. And I would submit that it was a false premise. Well, it may have been a false uh, a premise, but only in the sense that all political advertising uh, is false. Full-page ads uh, certainly don't allow for a dialogue between the reader and, and the agency that created them. Right, but the... Uh, the when, when Bobby Kennedy used to go down to those uh, colleges when he decided to run for president and simply have sort of a Beatles-type session with the students, it was always a foregone conclusion. His advanced men went down there. They set up a situation exactly... I was in Notre Dame when it happened. Exactly this number of people, exactly this kind of lights, exactly this. I mean, sure. Uh, I, I, I don't find it particularly appealing, incidentally, but I, I don't know that the free enterprise system, which is called democracy uh, in this case, is going to admit of anything less than an attempt to maximize your votes by whatever means. This is the only country in the world, however, which permits political candidates to actually buy airtime. No, no one else does it. You know, we do it because we're so advertising oriented. And if we can advertise toothpaste, you know, why not presidential candidates? And I think that what Kennedy did is just as false and just as invalid as what Nixon did. And again, you know, Nixon is not the first and won't be the last. He may have been the most successful, but it certainly wasn't the only candidate to use this kind of approach. And my complaint is not with his particular use of the approach, but my qualm is with, with, with the whole approach itself and the fact that it seems to be growing, that we have less and less direct communication with our candidate, that all we ever get to see now is the, f the televised image, the finished product of all these mechanics. So that on election day, you know, are we really voting for or against a particular candidate? Well, I, I see your point, but it seems to me that most Americans were benumbed by their exposures to the individual candidates, for instance, on the primary trail. How many times did we see Mr. Nixon answering questions on street corners in New Hampshire and so on and so forth? Uh, now, after he was nominated, granted, he went into another gear, uh, but he still exposed himself, gave speeches, answered questions. What he didn't do uh, was debate. Well, that's true. Uh, and what he didn't do was appear frequently on Meet the Press type programs. But I, I really think that you have simply taken uh, a particular campaign which was plotted one out of 26 <coughs> available ways to plot a campaign, and you have constructed a sort of an antichrist around the way that campaign was conducted uh, and in that way deceived a lot of people into thinking that you were saying generic things. 
Well, I think almost all campaigns today, when there is money and talent available, are constructed the same way. Mm -hmm. And I think more campaigns in the future will be. I mean, Harry Trelevin, who was Nixon's creative director of advertising, has already signed up with four different Republican senatorial candidates for 1970. You know, so you know, the same kind of approach, I'm sure, with adaptations for different local circumstances, will be used in that case. And I, I just don't think that it is an, uh, it's an approach that the people are not really prepared to contend with, because <coughs> it's our fault more than their fault. I mean, we, we used to believe everything we read, you know, and we learned the hard way that this was, uh, this, this was a bad thing to do. But I think we still believe everything we see on television. We haven't yet learned to look at television with the same critical eye with which we now look, and with which you are now looking at, you know, at what has been written, you know, we still tend, I think, to accept at face value, literally, uh, almost everything we see on television. And if this face value is is a different value from what lies behind it, I think we are permitting ourselves to be deceived. And it's not so serious when it's being deceived about a deodorant or, or a tube of toothpaste, but when it's about a man who wants to, to lead us either on a senatorial or, or as a governor or as a president, then I think we're moving into an area which, uh, which should be looked at pretty seriously. Mr. Hertzberg. Mr. McGinnis, what comes through in your book loud and clear is uh, Mr. N the contempt of Mr. Nixon and his advisors for the American people, and more particularly for the forgotten America, the pr group that they were appealing to especially. Uh, do you see any, any evidence that this attitude has been continued into the Nixon administration? Well, I don't I think they're, they're uh, they may be contemptuous of the intellectual response of these forgotten Americans, but I think they're very concerned about, uh, about the needs. And I think this was a legitimate uh, concern even during the campaign. But th this contempt factor, I think, uh, is a double-edged kind of sword, really. I think that they, the Nixon advertising people not only had contempt for the forgotten American, but they also seem to have a certain contempt for Mr. Nixon himself. Because if they really believed all the things that they claimed to believe about him and his abilities, I wonder why they were so reluctant to allow him to, uh, to face any kind of outside pressure. You know, if, if, if they were so convinced that this was you know, the great man, the best man, then why not let him express and expose himself? Why have it all so carefully But don't you think that's filtered? simplistic? Because um, uh, 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 a belief in the, uh, uh, in the prodigious talents of a person is not necessarily a belief that that person is successful in communicating them. And under the circumstances, you might, let's say, uh, believe that America would, would, be abs would have an absolutely glorious destiny under the stewardship of Mr. Jones, and might feel the only way to get Mr. Jones into the White House was by not letting anybody see or hear him. Well, so, so, so I, I find that hard to, uh, you know, to, to reconcile, that you could be so embarrassed about your man's inability to communicate. And actually, I think... Well, I didn't say they were embarrassed no. by it, but I say that, that hypothetically... But isn't communication... It's easy to see that your case doesn't hold up. Isn't right? communication really an important element of this whole leadership process? I mean, you know, what good is it to have a man with, with, with total brilliance and, and great mental acumen who is totally unable to communicate his ideas, his philosophies, and his leadership to the people? I think that the communication element is a very real and a significant part of, uh, of leadership today. Well, I think, I think you're correct. I think you're correct for reasons we'll maybe have a chance to go into. Uh, Ms. Duffy. Uh, in a recent report from the President's Commission on Violence, it's been suggested it was, you know, the board was started because of Bobby Kennedy's assassination, that perhaps because of the risk involved in having a presidential candidate campaign in public, that maybe all, you know, campaigning will have to be done on the television. Now, from what you've said about your view of this sort of thing, uh, do you think that there's any way that a nonlinear candidate, such as Nixon, could fare as well as, say, Bobby Kennedy obviously would have done 
through the use of television, or do you think it's possible for, for people to develop that critical eye that you were talking about? I don't know. I haven't seen too many signs in the year since the election of a critical eye being developed. But if the campaign has to be conducted on television, and it's kind of a sad thing that it does, although it may not make the campaign any more or any less communicative. And I don't think that, that much real communication takes place in a stump speech, you know, or in an auditorium, you know, when they give the, the, the standard speech to, to 500 partisans and they all applaud. You know, I don't know what kind of communication that is. But if, if the communication on television uh, is, is a free and open kind of thing, I think it can be valuable. I mean, I think it would be wonderful to, uh, to take the two candidates and just put them on two chairs like this and not have any moderator, any panel, any questioners, and just let them talk to each other for, say, for three hours, and just let them explore each other, and let this whole process be televised. That would have been a lot of Humphrey. Well, <laughs> <laughs> but it may have worked to Humphrey's disadvantage, <clears throat> because people might have said, well, look, this is really a shallow and garrulous person, and that Mr. Nixon, you know, is the man who has the penetrating questions and the succinct answers. You know, that could have worked to his advantage. That kind of uh, free and open and objective and, and x-ray type television, I think, could be very valuable, much more valuable than the in-person, uh, you know, whistle-stop campaigning. Mm -hmm. But if all the time on which a candidate appears on television has been bought, paid for, and by his own staff, and if every camera trained on him is actually in his employ, I think we're just going to have uh, increasingly uh, you know, contrived images projected. Well, would you consider though, like NBC or CBS or ABC, impartial? I mean, could they be considered impartial? Or wouldn't they be partial, even their cameramen and stuff? Well, I mean, they how wouldn't would you be, get you know, it objective? They wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't be produced you know, by a particular network. You might have, say, all three networks show the thing at the same time, mm -hmm. from 8 to 11 on a Wednesday night. Mm -hmm. you, know, when you, you mean including the conservative networks? Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> <coughs> and if you want to include a conservative candidate you know, for 30 <laughs> minutes of the three hours, that might be. This is Miss Audrey. I think that's a crucial question, though. I mean, you you point in the book to the Nixon people's hostility toward the media and they really believe that the networks are trying to do them in and it seems to me that that's the explanation for their eagerness to buy and package their own television time now what is a what's a candidate like Nixon gonna do if NBC is out to get him well do you really think they are I do sure I watched uh, I watched the returns come in and you could see the the pain on their faces, I think, is <laughs> Nixon rolled into an early lead. <clears throat> well, I, I didn't notice that, but maybe, you know, I might have just been tired. I'm not, I'm not denying that this kind of hostility could exist. Well, and let it, me, I don't know, me, you may repudiate this, but th this is Harry Trelevin, did you yeah. say? Talking about NBC, and he says, uh, NBC has a particular form, peculiar form of editorializing. For instance, they'll cut to some colored guy who's not applauding while Nixon talks of building bridges to human dignity. I think that's a fair that comment. Yeah, that's a fair comment. You know, so, so how does Nixon get around NBC unless he's going to package his own television time? Well, I think what he can do, uh, what a candidate should do, is have some sort of a combination. Uh, you know, have, have an NBC or have a network exposure and have his own exposure. Uh, through his own people if he has to buy time. And at least the viewer at home then could compare the two images and, you know, to notice uh, are they very different, are they very much the same. You know, if the candidate, uh, and of course, you know, you cite NBC, but, you know, the other network is CBS. And <coughs> Mr. Shakespeare, who was his chief television advisor, was a CBS executive. And the he was one... He salesman, right? Did he, he was a salesman, but the one, the one uh, unpaid interview that Mr. Nixon conducted during the campaign until those two quiz shows toward the end was a segment of 60 minutes in which Mike Wallace sat like this in a chair and talked to him for about 15 minutes. And this was projected to the country as a part of the, the journalistic 60 minute totally objective uh, thing. But it, it so happens that Mike Wallace is, you know, is a very strong Nixon partisan. You know, he likes Nixon very much. And he was obviously liking the man that much, uh, not going to, uh, to go after him even though he's a very, I think, you know, I'm not saying that he fudged the thing, because I think he's a very professional guy. You're not saying he was treasonable? I'm not saying he was treasonable or reasonable? Yeah. Treasonable. Treasonable, no, no. But I do think that if you say that my bias against Nixon uh, affects everything in, in the book, you must also be willing to consider the possibility. I, that, didn't, that, I didn't say that. No, I know, but, you know, right. it has been said. <laughs>
but uh, <laughs> consider the possibility that Mr. Wallace's bias in favor of Mr. Nixon might infuse this supposedly objective interview with I'll uh, accept that. That's why it seems to me that the most reasonable way to run a campaign is to let each candidate do his own material. But if that's all he does, you know, what basis do we have for making a judgment on who he is? You know, I, I don't have a simple answer for the thing. You know, I don't know that there is one, but uh, I think that it is at least a real problem. Mr. Hirschberg. Well, presumably you could solve that problem uh, by having the debate produced by representatives of both candidates. That would oh, yeah, I think you'd have it. to have, you know, ground rules established that were satisfactory to everyone. But this debate format <laughs> I don't think is very effective. It's like, it's like a ping pong game where, you know, they're asked a question, they have 40 seconds to reply. You know, that's foolish. But well, the you one you mentioned about having them both sit Yeah, there, just, like just talk sitting, to each other yeah. for a long time. You know, that would really be revealing. Do you think it would be a good idea if, if uh, well, as it is now, when you run a political announcement on television, you have to say, this is a political announcement. Do you think it would also be a good idea to, for, uh, to give credits, to have this be mandatory? This political announcement was produced by someone so written by someone. <coughs> Gags by Bob Hope. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Uh, we have just a few seconds. You want to answer that? I don't think it would make much difference. You know, people <laughs> don't pay much attention to credits anyway, I don't think. I do think it ought to be mentioned, incidentally, just in closing, that <clears throat> uh, uh, since Mr. Shakespeare's name has come up a couple of times, here's a man who left an extremely high-paying job because he knew Mr. Nixon, had faith in him, and wanted him to be president. So we oughtn't talk about him either as somebody who profiteered from an opportunity to advance himself because, in fact, he accepted sacrifices, or as a man who didn't know Mr. Nixon well, he having made the decision to serve him only after coming to know him. So there is no reason really to suppose that a grand uh, uh, dissimulation was the result of Mr. Shakespeare's maneuverings here, right? There are two interpretations of Mr. Shakespeare's involvement in the campaign, but in the limited time left, I wouldn't want to take up the other one. So I'll, let uh, your, <coughs> I'll accept yours. I'm sorry to cut you off, but good night and thank you all very much. Thank you. <coughs>